Hi, I'm your loving and concerned friend. Hoping you have a nice day, Real T. Today, we are doing part two of the Marvel Cinematic Universe Iceberg. If you missed part one, link in the bio. I highly recommend it because that's where we start from the 10% of the iceberg that everybody knows about. Then we dive into the 90% of the things people might not know about and it gets cryptic the deeper we go and so we are starting at level four because we ended the last one at the end of level three as far as how cryptic and how deep the iceberg is and so be sure to watch that before you watch this anyway let's get right into it level four emily blunt black widow was Emily Blunt a Black Widow? Emily Blunt has revealed she turned down the part of Black Widow in Marvel Cinematic Universe to star in a film she didn't want to be in. According to Emily Blunt, she appeared in Gulliver Travels, not because she wanted to be in the film, but because she had a contractual obligation to do so. That is the saddest thing I've ever heard in my life for Gulliver's travel you lost the opportunity to be Black Widow and Scarlett Johansson took up that helm like a boss like the baddest coolest person ever Scarlett Johansson took up Black Widow and was like I'm gonna take this in stride I am so so sorry Emily Blunt you totally missed out and I know you probably have insane FOMO over not having the role of Black Widow. I would be mad if I was you. A contractual obligations. Wow, that sucks so much. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you guys do, but I had no idea. Besides the research, that is. But you know, the great thing about this is typically uh, with how much the Marvel Cinematic Universe is expanding in the future of it, you might see Emily Blunt a new Marvel movie. Who's to say? WHIH News. What is WHIH News? Okay, well, it's a news front in an American web series based on the Marvel Cinematic Universe television network. The web series was produced by Marvel Studio in partnership with Google and aired on YouTube. The first season was released during July 2015 as a part of a viral marketing for Ant-Man, while the second season was released during April through May 2016 as a part of viral marketing for Captain America Civil War. So I don't know if you guys remember this, I slightly do, but there's a YouTube channel that still exists. You can look it up. I'm gonna have links in the bio. And it's just news report about what's happening in like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but for our universe on YouTube. And so I think that's really cool. It's really interesting. Link in the bio, watch that stuff. <laughs> this viral marketing campaign, whether it did well or not, I barely remember it. I do remember clicking on like one or two videos back in the day when it did happen. And uh, I think it probably did the job that they wanted for like a YouTube audience and they wanted to test the field and see if it'll work, you know, and let's be honest, it's a write off. So Marvel would be like, why not? You know, if we're going to get taxed for all this stuff anyway. <laughs> so good for them. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I don't think they kept doing it. I think that's why we haven't heard about it since 2016, because probably it didn't do, do, do too well. But hey. The more you know. 1990s Captain America references in the Winter Soldier. Yeah, apparently in the 1990 Captain America was referencing the Winter Soldier. I'll be honest, I try to look all over the internet, a lot of Google searches, um, Reddit searches. I couldn't really find the reference. I mean, other than Captain America Winter Soldier being a movie about Captain America, but the specific 90s version of Captain America that had the old school actor, Matt Salinger, which the movie also featured Red Skull back in the day too. So it's kind of had probably a lot of things that could uh, relate the two movies as far as that goes, because the Red Skull and Captain America are very connected. But otherwise, I couldn't find anything. If you do know anything about it, leave a comment down below. Help me out. <laughs> Fight for the Cabin. 
after researching this one, the only thing I could really find, and this could be referring to a lot of different things, is Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. safe house. Now, right here, it says, it was a safe house for people with power. Rogers even spent a few weeks here after he was defrosted. And apparently, Bruce Banner constructed this safe house as a temporary house gift for individuals. It's like a little retreat. And by the way, this all takes place in the Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D timeline where phil colson exists and they have like a multiple seasons of our phil colson's team of heroes doing their thing okay it could be that it could also be iron man in his cabin uh that he had a daughter and then the i love you 3000 happened that's where they also had the funeral or Iron Man whenever he passed away and everybody was sitting there at the end of Avengers Endgame. And that was the fight of the cabin. But maybe not. Like I said, this is open-ended and maybe the creator of this one could chime in if he would like, because that would be a big help. <laughs> or leave a comment if you have any ideas what this is talking about. I think it's probably the Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. one. Larson's hate was manufactured. Do you guys know who Brie Larson is? She is Captain Marvel. And so during the time that she got casted, and I don't know if you remember this, but I do. It was so loud online from when she got casted all the way to even now, but from the her movie release and to the Avengers Endgame, every week there was like online fire and drama about her being in that role. And later on, what this is talking about specifically Larson's hate manufactured is the other cast of the Avengers and her not liking them and not really liking the Avengers Endgame movie and the decisions to cut her out a lot of the scenes and they're just being a lot of like angst and like fire in there and my reasoning behind why I I'm on the sign that it might be manufactured is that there's so much fire online and Marvel really isn't doing anything to stop it it goes alongside with bad press can be good press depending on how it depicts your film because this is focusing on an individual and maybe it's in her contract where she can't do certain things or can't react a certain way or reveal the truth whether it is manufactured or not i would just think on a professional level that this is something an actor wouldn't exactly do especially if they're a well-trained actor like brie larson who has been on jimmy kimmel i was first introduced to brie larson in short term 12 the movie and she was an incredible actor she played grace howard and in the movie she just she wins like awards for this role anyway uh, it's definitely worth watching if you haven't seen it but someone who has so many years of acting experience i could not imagine having such not kind things to say about the biggest thing they've been in you know it feels very unprofessional especially saying out loud in public like in a way where like are they gonna fire you if you say something like this and they could you know because disney have recasted so many people but i think it's intentional i think brie larson is the type of person who's strong enough to take all the criticism laugh it off work out and just like make the next movie and just like you know fan off the flame just keep it going um and we already see that because like i said earlier she's been getting hate for her role as captain marvel and a lot of love and support as well but there's just been a fire around her whole casting since she got casted to now even her like sequel movie for captain marvel it's like it's just so much fire but i think there's a reason marvel isn't trying to stop any of that i mean you can't at the end of the day but they're not like denouncing it in a way where like should be more supportive of like their actors right there there's got to be a reason why she's the only one that's getting a lot of this versus all the other actors that are part of marvel but that's a theory <laughs> last thing i know about brie larson no. <laughs> don't hate me too much i think she has the capability to be an amazing actor with the right script the right director she's proven it before and she's going to prove it again in future productions um but when she's given all the things and has the role that she can shine then i think it's gonna be worthwhile i'm not gonna talk about her role in captain marvel though <laughs> <laughs> ruffalo spilled the beans 
I remember when this happened. So in 2017 on Good Morning America, and you gotta be aware that like during this time, whenever any Marvel movies comes out, the actors for the films have hundreds of press interviews, uh, online shows, podcasts, everything under the sun to just hype the movie up so people go out and see it in the theaters. So out of all those, one slip up happened. And this has happened with other actors too, by the way. I, mean, I think Tom Holland has even like slipped up some moments here and there. But um, basically Ruffalo <laughs> is sitting with Don Cheeto and they're talking about <laughs> the Avengers movie. And then it goes on for a couple minutes and then bam, out of nowhere, like, well not out of nowhere. They, they get progged with questions over and over. And uh, Mark Ruffalo is like, yeah, man, everybody dies. Just everybody dies. And they're like, what? And he's like, oh, wait, can we can we not put that in? Can we re-edit this? <laughs> it comes out and damn, it's like the biggest spoiler for Avenger Endgame. Like people might have guessed it, but like it was all theories. But like, oh, my God, it would totally kill the experience if you hadn't seen the movie or back then when the movie wasn't released. Look, the movie's been out for a couple years now, so I'm not gonna consider this spoiler if you haven't watched it. I already told you before, this is a spoiler video. It's about Marvel MCU, so like, you, you shouldn't know what you're getting into. But yeah, I have a clip of that exact thing happening with Mark Ruffalo in the interview, in the bio. Be sure to check it out. It's kind of funny looking back at it now. But, I'm glad he didn't get fired for that because I think he's a great actor and I love him as the Hulk. Punisher and the Winter Soldier. So this is actually a joke. I'm just gonna say it straight out. Like I did a lot of research and it took a bit of time, but it's just a joke in the community. But I just wanna say that the Netflix show Punisher with John Bernthal is really good. It's amazing. And if you haven't seen it, it kind of sucks because like if it's not canon, because of the bitter relationship with Netflix and Disney Plus, it's just they had to cancel a lot of those uh, the Defender series with Daredevil, Luke Cage, all of them. Like they just took them out <laughs> of the continuity of the MCU, which is very sad. I talked a lot about this, by the way, in part one. So if you want to watch that, you know, I give out more details on just the Defenders and what ha end up happening. But um, yeah, it's unfortunate. But you know, maybe in one MCU universe timeline, all these Defenders, Punisher, Jessica Jones, they exist and they're canonical. But we won't know till the multiverse comes out. Marvel's creative committee. Okay, list of people that hate the Marvel Creative Committee. If you don't know what the Marvel Creative Committee is, it's basically a committee at Disney that have a big say in what's gonna happen in these movies. And I think they've kind of taken a step back for the next 15 movies. But back in the day, from the first Iron Man all the way to Avengers Endgame, they had big comments to people like Kevin Foggy and Josh Whedon and about how certain things in the movie they want to change and they would have to argue back and forth and once again if you watch part one i talk about edgar wright and how he did not like this part of it and this is probably the reason he had to take a step back was because of this creative committee and other directors as well that maybe were sculpted out for the marvel mcu universe so i'm going to read a couple examples of what people had a problem with Terrence Howard, he wanted more money, but Marvel said no. And after Don Cheadle was cast, Pearl Mutter made a racist comment about Howard and Cheadle. Dang, that's terrible. Oh my gosh. John Favreau, he was so unhappy with the results of Iron Man 2 that he refused to direct Iron Man 3. Okay, I'm just going to read all of these because they're really good and it's things you just don't know about and it's a great conversation maker of any situation so terrence howard this was the original per, uh, actor for war machine was wanting more money but marvel said no and after don cheeto was casted pearl mutter made a racist comment about howard and cheeto john favreau he was unhappy with the results of iron man 2 so unhappy that he refused to direct iron man 3 Okay, so just so you know, the creative committee had so many changes they wanted to make to the movie of Iron Man 2, it made it into something that 
Jon Favreau just wasn't happy enough with. Um, just for some context. Okay, Mickey Rourke. He was very unhappy on working Iron Man 2. And he was pissed at committee for cutting most of his scenes out that he made a vow to he would never be involved with another superhero film again. Oh my gosh. Mickey Rourke, I believe, was one of the villains in the movie. And that is very unfortunate that they took him out of so many scenes. I hate it. <laughs> like, it probably would have been a better movie with him in there. But you, these things happen. You just don't really have control when there's so much money in the pot. I'm glad that they're taking a step back for these newer movies, by the way. Rebecca Hall, she was upset that Maya Hansen was demoted to small roles after she was promised that she would be the Mandarin. But Pearl Mutter nixed this idea as he wasn't big on female main villains. How are you gonna get casted for something and them just totally retcon it or cancel it before, you know, while you're shooting and stuff? That's ridiculous. Alan Taylor. He was not particularly fond of his experience on making the movie. He claimed that he was given a lot of freedom when he was filming only for executive meddling to change everything in post-productive. Oh! This is like what happened to uh, Justice League, you know, whenever they had the Josh Whedon cut and this versus the Zack Snyder cut. And I know I'm not talking about, supposed to be talking about DC, but like the difference is so, like so major that it makes a movie that you hate into a movie that you love if you watch like the Zack Snyder cut versus like watching the Josh Whedon cut that cuts out all the great things about the Zack Snyder cut. Natalie Portman, she wasn't too happy with this project from the start to the point where she reported attempting to quit in protest of the departure of initial director Patty Jenkins and only stayed on because it was less trouble than potentially getting sued for a breach of contract in mid-2016. She admitted that she's very unlikely to ever reprise her role as Jane. Oh my gosh. Yeah, she was. this was a part of the Thor movies and I guess that's why we haven't seen her since. But she might reappear, you know, and it's been a couple. It's been a long time since 2016. So there's hope. Christopher Eccleston, he played Malekith in Thor The Dark World. He said that Marvel misled him in neglecting to mention that he was required to sit in a makeup chair for six to eight hours a day to have his makeup and facial prosthetic applied. He also admittedly only took the role for this movie for the money in the first place. James Gunn, he didn't get along with the committee and he revealed the reason why Ronan was messy because committee were given away way too many inputs on the villains and they wanted to nix songs for no reason. And he even called them like they were a group of comic book writers and toy people. So maybe he's saying that in a way to where like, they don't exactly understand filmmaking and the art and the artistry and professionalism that it takes to make a movie. Not to say that it isn't applied to comic books or toys, but like they're different industries and different things have different stories to tell and different ways to tell them. It's kind of like reading a manga and making an anime. They're just completely different. And all of a sudden you're introduced to the sound, you're introduced to just the textures, you're introduced to the cinematic styles you can tell a story through film so you know james gunn is definitely a professional josh whedon he left age of ultron because of the committee and he got burnt out from making the film he actually had to fight to keep the barton family a barn scene in the movie and the committee wanted him to cut the scene out and he didn't did but the committee told him that they wanted age of ultron to have a thor subplot that set up the events of ragnarok which I guess didn't exist so like that's you know a lot of a lot more filming a lot more stress for a director right so um i can see little things like that it's like the toy thing right they need more thor toys they need to introduce more heroes more villains so that they can make money and sell stuff and so i can see a little thing like that being like oh come on i'm trying to make a movie that tells a really great story uh now i have to introduce this thor ragnarok subplot so that we can like prep some toys for his movie and it's just like that has nothing to do with age of ultron right it's distracting edgar wright 
he left Ant-Man because committee got too much control of the film and he felt like it wasn't his film at all and he couldn't stand them messing around with his story and his style and his cinematic sense of humor if you've seen an edgar wright movie you know like his style you know his sense of humor and it's unfortunate that that happened because as an artist you gotta let an artist tell their story and if you're gonna hire him, let him tell him the way it he wants to, you know? So that's the real reason Edgar Wright left. It was the creative committee. Oh my gosh, it makes so much sense now. Like, it's not even like in relation to Kevin Foggy or the rest. And maybe that's why we're hearing that there's a chance Edgar Wright might come back for these next 15 movies in the cinematic universe uh, that's coming forward. But like, it's because the committee's taking a step back. Kevin Foggy, this is the guy basically responsible for the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and how everything connects right now and working with everybody to bring it together, all the different directors and actors. After what happened with Age of Ultron and Ant-Man, he went directly to Disney and told them that he did not want to deal with the creative committee anymore and that they had become control freaks for the MCU. And he wanted to report straight to Disney from now on. I heard he allegedly didn't get along with Joe Quesada. And so you're hearing it now, like it's, I didn't, wasn't aware that this creative committee wasn't even Disney. It's something else like comic book, Marvel. I guess it's the Marvel team. That's so interesting. It's definitely worth looking into. It's like a, this is a whole separate video I can make about it, but this is an iceberg video. So let's continue forward. By the way, there's a Reddit link in the bio going into more details on the Marvel creative committee. Captain America Serpent Society. So back in 2016, it was announced that Captain America Civil War was actually Serpent Society as a joke whenever they first announced it for phase three of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Kevin Foggy worked together with Mike P to come up with this great idea and it's completely a joke. And it was just them messing around with Marvel nerds. Because if you think about Serpent Society, it makes you think of Hydra, it makes you think of like a different path. And if the fans thought it was cool and funny, maybe it might be a mistake that they would have to commit to, but no, it was Civil War. And I think Serpent Society, when I was looking it up, by the way, too, I saw a lot of pictures of like lizard people. I mean, that didn't end up happening, but um imagine that time and seeing this like little joke on there and be like wait the next captain america movie is about lizard people in hydra i guess what <laughs> nah civil war man one of the greats of the marvel cinematic universe the real civil war marvel's restructuring in 20 years marvel has risen from bankruptcy to multi-billion dollar business on august 31st 2009, the Walt Disney Company announced it would require Marvel Comics Parents Corporation Marvel Entertainment for a cash and stock deal of worth approximately $4 billion, which, if necessary, would be adjusted at closing. Given Marvel's shareholders $30 and 0.745 Disney shares for each share of Marvel they owned. As of 2008, Marvel and its major longtime competitor, DC Comics, shares over 80% of the American comic book market. What is this plot is kind of talking about, or this point, is that so many times in Marvel's lifetime as a company, it's almost gone bankrupt. And by the nick of like fate, it comes back. It comes back. And it's like it, they make art and it dies and it comes back and so finally once disney bought it and they started making their movies the rise of marvel came back and it's been like thumbs up it's gonna be here for a while and that's the real civil war the restructuring of what Marvel used to be before it was owned by Disney and what it is now, which is a massive powerhouse of some of the most talented people, I think in the world, really. Level five, Tony teaches responsibility. What did Sp Iron Man have to teach Spider-Man? Well, one of the most polarizing lessons that Iron Man had to teach a young Peter Parker is for the young man to be better than Iron Man. After saving Spider-Man from people destroying a fairy, Spider-Man was disappointed because he nearly got himself and others killed from this whole boat fiasco and Iron Man had to come in and swoop in and save him. 
and that's when they had that like moment that's similar to uncle ben with great power comes great responsibility except this time it was iron man saving spider-man's butt uh, in spider-man homecoming and being like yo be better than me don't make the same mistakes i do and don't get too big in the head just like be a superhero but be a better superhero than me and dang you know he plays the role of theoretically peter parker's uncle which i appreciate in this universe you know things being a little different don't make me upset because if we heard the same story over and over and over like i like to be surprised when it comes to some of these comic books and something as little as that that makes sense in this marvel cinematic universe by the way and it's not like uncle ben didn't already have this lesson with peter parker because peter parker was already being a hero right before he met iron man but it makes sense that even further even if you go back in the old comics like peter parker or spider-man like learned a lot from the heroes around him i think initially it was a fantastic war really and and the, his relationship with them and so I, I really appreciate this relationship with Iron Man and I think it's a great twist on how Spider-Man learns to be a hero they all look the same so we you probably hear this a lot from people who watch the movies and feel like every movie is like a carbon copy of each other and it makes sense because I guess visual tones and styles and posters just kind of breathe out this energy or you can say like a superhero movie is just a superhero movie and I get what they're saying but like as a superhero fan and someone who really loves the movies and been following since the first Spider-Man movie with Sam Raimi's whenever that came out I cannot be more just conflicted by that kind of message because I don't think they're the same at all in fact i think all of them are so different from each other you can tell because the, by the way people respond to them and like yes okay so the basis of a movie is plot comedy plot comedy plot comedy and final battle but like every different hero has their own story to tell and they're all different they act differently they're different ages they're from different situation and i think the important thing about that is that each story moves somebody else like for example i really loved gardens of the galaxy one because it was about a bunch of misfits coming together and learning how to kind of be heroes but not actually be super successful at it just kind of like doing the bare minimum to get past the finish line and and just be good friends along the way and learn more about each other and that really moved me the whole movie was just it like moved my heart it really meant a lot and so like for someone else that could have been ant-man a heist movie there was someone else that could have been civil war where you have two best friends having to duke it out and face each other like these movies are to me there's they're are so different there's so many different plots so many different things repackaged but like with new light and that's like saying watching one horror movie is like watching all horror movies it just does not hold up natasha hater so there's a lot to unpack in this one and i had to do some deep diving to figure it out so there's this guy named david hater and back in 2004 before like most of the cinematic marvel universe they wanted to make a black widow motion picture and this guy almost got screenlit for a movie in fact they got to the screenwriting stage and him and avi arad started pro producing and figuring it out but in june 2006 lionsgate were dropped the project and the rights of the character were, were reverted to marvel so basically you remember how we had those slew of like daredevil movies back in the day and other like blade and all these different kind of marvel movies but not connected I, it might have been something more like that and dave Hader, by the way if you didn't know he plays uh the voice for king shark in the flash he's done metal gear solid he's probably most known for being solid snake or a naked snake in the metal gear solid games so he's just an all-around like artist talented person actor writer director producer all that jazz so i think that's what they're talking about in this it just says natasha hater and i'm only assuming black widow because her name is natasha so and then hater is was was the director for this so like making those connection so yeah sucks but hey at least we're getting a 2021 black widow movie uh although unfortunately he is not involved in it that i could find or 
that's out there online. So the defenders were almost in Infinity War. And if you don't know who the defenders are, we talked about it in part one. It's basically Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, Daredevil, Iron Fist coming together to become the defenders. And they had their whole Netflix series, and their own like kind of connecting storyline. It was very high quality, very fun. Listen to what the internet has to say. While fans were hoping for the likes of Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist to pop up in Avengers Infinity War, sadly for them, they didn't. Nevertheless, director Russo Brothers have revealed they nearly did. Speaking with Variety, Anthony Russo admitted it was certainly discussed. It would have been really fun to see them in the Avengers and things would have played out a lot differently, probably. And could you imagine the Daredevil like running in the field with like Spider-Man and like fighting alongside him? It's kind of funny because these heroes are a lot more grounded than the Avenger heroes or the MCU heroes because they're all very much like more the local hometown, hometown Hell's Kitchen, New York heroes. Would have been a different perspective for sure, to see them in the Avengers films. James Gunn, Taserface rant. This is what he said. When I first got Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, I posted a picture of Taserface, the dumbest character of all time, Guns explained. I posted a picture of him and said, this is gonna be the star of the Guardians of the Galaxy. And people were laughing and making fun of him and I made this big joke and then I'm like, no, 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 I'm." not really gonna do that <laughs> i think in this movie we have the head of the ravager as a real dumbass <laughs> a very powerful guy i decided he named himself and called himself taser face <laughs> and here are some pictures of like what taser face looked like in fact this is to go deeper this is concept art of what taser face could have looked like and he ended up looking like this live action version which is rich it's funny well, you know that's what i want to say about it you know he's a villain or an anti-hero and he plays the role really good and i guess that's saran that's what we're talking about you can't wait to see him in guardians of the galaxy th volume three right i'm actually really excited like i said earlier guardians of the galaxy has a special place in my heart i love james gunn i talked about his movie super in the part one and about how i like love all his movies uh, from his past to now and they all just have so many amazing moments i love the music he's inspired me to write movies scripts etc a real hero in my heart i'd love to meet him one day we didn't cut hoax moment what is this about josh whedon went on to break down the differences between what he calls a move in a moment, which he's spoken about in previous interviews. While he originally thought the Hulk scene was a moment which developed organically from previous scenes and developed a compelling payoff, it turned out to be a move, something which the filmmaker was trying to build around. This Hulk scene is said to be so good that it would be the fist pumping moment of the MCU, but the director decided to sacrifice it for the greater good of the story as a whole. Sometimes what seems like a moment turns out to be a move. That turned out to be a move. It's a great gag, but I just couldn't justify it. We were building a lot of the final battle around it and it was killing us. Even when we were shooting, we had to stutter step everything else. Eventually in post, I convinced them we need to jettison this concept. I knew I could write a conclusion for Bruce and Natasha that I thought would be better for storytelling and would be a real moment. This was for Avengers 2 Age of Ultron, by the way, and it's the best Hulk moment we never got to see. It's not even in deleted scenes or anything, and it's very unfortunate, but I will say Josh Whedon did say that you could save that moment for a later film. And so we don't know if we end up seeing that, but in my perspective, Feel like the hulk still hasn't gotten his time to shine talked about this in part one again but professor hulk we missed out on the entirety of a like a solo movie seeing bruce banner like dealing with his internal struggles with the hulk and the hulk dealing with his internal struggle goes and just coming together as friends and be able to become one because of what happened in you know avengers infinity war like 
there's so much details I want to figure out because it's like we missed the training montage for like a Dragon Ball Z character to become Super Saiyan. We just miss the most epic moments in the it, it hurts. It really does feel like the Hulk is one of the coolest heroes and he gets sidelined throughout all of the MCU films. Like when are we going to get a Hulk solo movie that focuses on all these sub points that I think they're really good story to tell because at the end of the day, the Hulk is about anger, malice, and how a man deals with his relationship with that. It, it's very masculine and I would love to see a story really iron out and tell that in a modern way in a way that I don't think we've seen something quite like that maybe since Fight Club you know that's like the last movie I remember that was very masculine very much about you know your anger and your angst dealing with like your normal self-worth and pathetic self and the anxiety of it and once again that was Edward Norton of course they chose him to be the Incredible Hulk and I really think that's the and we talked about this in part one too Edward Norton wanted to take a different direction with the Incredible Hulk and that's why I think he had creative difference so he had to take a step back because of the Marvel Creative Committee oh my gosh everything connects right oh we go back to that point in part one where everything in the Marvel Cinematic Universe connects so it makes sense we're connecting dots here that started from the beginning of the video or this part one to now I'm kind of mind blown right now but yeah man it's unfortunate um, and I really hope they tell the Hulk story like one day because to me, he's one of the heroes that has a lot to say versus just smash, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Holland and Iger's drunk phone call. So we're back in 2019. Tom Holland is getting cast as Spider-Man, but unfortunately, Sony is having co-financing disagreements with Disney who owns Marvel and the rights for Spider-Man and you you guys already know Sony ownership of Spider-Man has been back from Sam Raimi's all the way to the Amazing Spider-Man in fact they made the Amazing Spider-Man because they wanted to keep the rights for Spider-Man and so they just rebranded him remade him and retold his story with Andrew Garfield and um and now we have Tom Holland. And so Tom Holland nearly didn't happen. But at that moment, Tom Holland got drunk and called Bob Iger, who is the CEO of Disney, by the way. And he was like, he just kept going on. There's a video about it, link in the bottom, by the way. Is there anything I can do? Just please, sir, please. Is there anything you can do? And, to, and it was a very passionate phone call to keep Spider-Man in the MCU films. And luckily, a few weeks after that, Tom Holland was announced that he was officially in future MCU films production. So blessings happen. I really like Tom Holland as the new Spider-Man. And you know what? I'm excited to see him deal with other multiverse versions of Spider-Man, aka Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. Like, I'll say this specifically about amazing spider-man i know a lot of people didn't like it but it's the only spider-man story that isn't completed there's something left to be said because if you think about it the last thing that happened is gwen stacy passed away because of peter parker emma stone and andrew garfield and so he would be at a very specific moment isn't that just something you want to see you want to see like what's next to this character what is, is his arc how does he come back from this just some food for thought maybe it'll happen in the multiverse of madness or spider-man no way home there's so many rumors right now like every day i'm seeing rumors about spider-man and leaks about like who's gonna be in the movie dr octavius or like you know the green goblin and all this stuff william defoe like i love william defoe like i'm kind of so passionate about spider-man and stuff that i might make a video about it later just like seeing what could happen the theories and what will happen and what is a confirmed or not confirmed if you'd like to see that by the way leave a comment and i'll try to make it <laughs> spider-man 2 is marvel cinematic universe canon so in spider-man 2 
Jameson references that he is aware of Doctor Strange. People have argued that it's possible the Strange he was referring to was Marvel Cinematic Universe Strange and that Strange has made a number of prior visits to the Raimi universe we don't yet know about. It's skeptical idea, but it's interesting, right? Multiverse of Madness could really make it all a reality. Like, let's be honest. And this is what I was talking about earlier. I want to make a solo video about this because it goes deep, okay? There's a lot to dig in. It could be a really long video about who's confirmed, who's not, and if it's even real. Like, Marvel is trying to, like, put everything under the rug and be like, shh, 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 don't talk about it. <laughs> Of course, that makes more hype, you know, <laughs> and I would just love to just dig deep and, and let, let's figure out what the truth is, right? Um, I want to look into Jameson and find that scene where he says that uh, about Doctor Strange. Like, I didn't even remember that, but apparently it happened. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. And once again, Tommy Maguire, I hate to say it, he's my favorite Spider-Man cinematic universe, but that's because I like the way he portrayed the role. Like to me, growing up, playing the video games, watching the animated Spider-Man movies, I thought Peter Parker was most like Tommy Maguire's rendition of Spider-Man. So take that for what it's worth. <laughs> a little goofy, a little, you know, awkward, but has a good heart, you know, and tries his best. It makes mistakes, makes a lot of mistakes, but at the end of the day, does his best with the power he's given. Level six. Oh my gosh, it's been all day. Ben Parker in Iron Man. Ben Parker was introduced in the first Iron Man movie. Wait, this happened, I didn't know. During the press conference scene, Tony calls on a reporter he names as Ben. Oh, retroactively, Spider-Man 3 could explain that Ben Parker was a journalist with the Daily Bugle. Peter, working at a newspaper, hasn't been established yet. So if they got the route in Spider-Man 3, they could use Ben's previous employment at the Bugle as Peter's drive to getting a job there. Just a fun little theory. So this is once again, another theory. And the idea is that Ben used to work at the Daily Bugle. And when Robert Downey Jr. in the first Iron Man uh, movie says, Hey, a reporter named Ben, what do you want? That could be Uncle Ben before he passes away and gives his mantle or his like kind words to Peter Parker as Spider-Man. It would be a cool connection and it'd be a really witty way for uh, this universe Peter Parker to work for the Daily Bugle for some extra cash or whatever reason they make for it. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it doesn't. Uh, I do think it's a stretch, but uh, you know, the imagination can run wild and anything is possible. <laughs> Sokovia equal Latvia. Okay, there's a lot to read here, so, and I've tried a couple of times already, so I'm just gonna read it. Just <laughs> forgive me. Where exactly is Sokovia? The real answer, oddly enough, is London. In canon, Sokovia is a fictional country like Wakanda, located in the hills of Eastern Europe. And now, it has never been geographically pinpointed for us on a map. However, it commonly believed to be somewhere in Balkans, sandwiched near Slavic countries. However, as far as the MCU goes, Sokovia was actually shot in Hendon Police College, a London facility for training recruited officers. Over the period of five months, Marvel slowly took control of dozens of buildings, empty streets, and real estate in college areas, converting them to war zone Sokovia landscapes as we see in the films. Okay, so a lot of Sokovia. Okay, in one clip, we see Adavu Skipsi, a brand of Latvian potato chips, a fan noted this and theorized that Sokovia may actually be where we know as Latvia. I think the idea is that Latvia is, is a place in our metaverse and that's where they filmed Sokovia scenes from the movie. Yeah, lots of graffiti signs. I got a little picture, but that's what I'm thinking here. 
um, you know, we're on level six, so it gets pretty cryptic and secretive in with the theories. So I'm not completely sure. If you have more details on this one, please let me know. I tried my best. Foggy's The Amazing Spider-Man Two Notes. This is just some of the excerpts he had to say. In fact, screw this. I'm gonna read you all of them because why go off and read it yourself on Reddit? I'm gonna leave a link in the bio, but oh my gosh, let's do this. Uh, there are too many storylines. We need to choose which ones we are focusing on and lift out the other ones, i.e. could reduce father arc to just Roosevelt. Could cut out plane crash and Richard destroying spiders and start on armored car. Don't start with Spider-Man. Let the danger stakes to New York City build first and then have Spider-Man enter the scene heroically. I love this. This is like if I made something and, you know, Kevin Foggy had notes on it, like I, that's why I want to read this all, by the way, like it's education for you and me. It's like he's critiquing us. What if we made a movie and he was like, yo, fix these bars. Tone down Paul Giamatti's performance. So he seems a bit more menacing and less cartoonish. Really good note. Really good note as a, yep. If you cut Richard from the opening in the plane crash, maybe you could instead do Harry coming home and seeing Norman at the top of the movie as a cold open. Gets the audience thinking, man. Really love Electro. Feels like you may not need the scene of his apartment, which makes him seem completely crazy and hard to relate to. Valid. Like the idea that eel goes in his mouth. It, instead of borrowing, you see it glow within him. Ooh, that is nice. Need to set up the power plant earlier visually. Facts. <laughs> I'm just saying little things. <laughs> Seems like the movie switches point of views a lot. Why are we in Max's point of view during the car sh chase? Worth looking at this playing out from the spider's point of view. True. I mean, I'm watching a Spider-Man movie. Let me see Spidey's point of view. <laughs> there could be a better way to reveal that Peter is missing graduation. Maybe when you cut to Gwen, you cut to the wide shot and it shows like a graduation in the wide shot and Peter or something. Okay, yeah, little visual notes always. If you can visually tell the story to help out, you that should always be an option for sure. Tiny note, don't think Peter would lie to Gwen about sirens, maybe he just downplays it. What is with like, superhero and drama and lying to like their significant others i feel like if you're gonna be a hero this is like 101 basic you just don't do <laughs> uh, so i like that note a lot man stan lee cameo maybe needs a little less emphasis on peter here trying to get out of his costume and not to be in scene set up a little more the pressure of the principal getting closer and closer to calling his name okay and I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Stan Lee in Amazing Spider-Man 2 was a janitor in the movie. And so it's like in the high school that Peter Parker is going to where this all happens. So makes sense. Instead of seeing the ghost of Captain Stacy, can we just hear the voice in Peter's head and maybe flash back to the last movie? Don't think we should add Cap Stacy back into the car chase scene yeah adding a ghost i mean it's it's really like the director's style you know if, if that's something he likes to do but you know i i also agree with like a flashback i don't you know it, it's cool hearing this because like if they did make those changes with the notes or they didn't we can see it you know and be like oh dang this was supposed to be completely different that was supposed to be a ghost stacy dad over here whoa but now it's a flashback and that that's what they did and they saved time you know i don't know <laughs> there is too much back and forth with peter and gwen we can recut the dim sum scene so that it doesn't feel so repetitive of their breakup in the last movie can peter be more honorable and definitive and less wishy-washy yeah by the way if you don't know what dim sum is you're like what, what what's a dim sum it's um like a chinese or 
Asian type sit down meal where like they bring out lots of little dumpling dishes and also like vegetable dishes or teas. And uh, you basically wait for a cart to come around your table and you can pick what you want and they'll serve it to you right then and there. It's very cool, very like street food-esque, but high quality. I've been to a lot of them. Uh, they have them in a lot of the bigger cities, uh, but yeah, love it. I think the first time I went was for a wedding uh my, one of my family and i was like oh my gosh dim sum it's so good if you haven't heard of it look it up look up some youtube videos really good food why do we need a year to pass <laughs> imagine being the director or like the writer or someone working on the movie be like he's right <laughs> i've had that happen when uh, someone really good like critiques your work Harry's story feels like the main plot of the movie. Peter should look into the past because of Harry. Maybe find some photos of them together as kids, use obsession wall more to set up the part of his past, not just what happened to his parents. It's a movie about Spider-Man, right? <laughs> not sure what Peter learns at Roosevelt. It is entirely correct. We are distracted by the idea that Peter became Spider-Man because of his father's blood? All this special backstory with his super scientist dad fights with the idea that Peter is a normal kid from Queens who becomes the greatest superhero in the world. Facts! Oh my gosh, this is like number one for me, man. Like I love Peter Parker because he's a normal kid or e even less even, you know what I mean sometimes? Like he's like the nerd kid or he's not supposed to be someone who's cool. You know, he's kind of awkward. He's socially stilted. Um, and because of that, he becomes the greatest hero. Like anybody, like Spider-Man is am amazing. I have like 10 suits. I have so many Spider-Man suits and it's like Spider-Man can be anybody. That's the idea. Like any average show, like they had to just choose be a good hero you know and of course peter parker you know he is his own self i, I mean that in a, like a light term but like um you know spider-man he is just someone who chose to try his best you know and that's what i love about him andrew's performance is all over the place a lot of crying and then a lot of mania hard to track him emotionally sometimes it undermines his emotion to gwen's death because he gets upset and emotional a lot <laughs> Savage. <laughs> Don't like the idea that May tells Peter his parents were spies because two seconds later he finds out they are not in it again fights with the idea that he's an ordinary kid. Dang man, these notes are like incredible. <laughs> like the idea that May finds out that he's Spider-Man, finds his costume and instead of just the Rose Mary Harris wink wink all the time. <laughs> kind of like the morgue but hate the dancing mortician cliche is that a cliche a dancing mortician leave a comment if you know i i don't know if i've exactly seen that are you using vfx to show how electro is traveling from one point to another burst of electricity makes sense need to underscore capture of goblin more sirens as you linger on clock 121, 122 AM. Nice touch, a hey, compliment. Surveillance scenes should be about following Harry, not Peter. No one should be following Peter. Yeah. Can Electro hum itsy bitsy spider before he plays it electronically? Maybe we can use this again. Maybe intercut the ending montage and hearing Gwen's speech with someone going into special projects and revealing more Easter eggs and see that the rhino case has been broke into and the suit is missing. Great way to transition to rhino ending. Don't need Aunt May in the kitchen. <laughs> like, yo, man, cut that out. We don't need that here. Get it out of here, man. Trash. <laughs> Spider-Man needs to feel more directly responsible for preventing the planes from crashing. Yes, dude. Spider-Man cares about people. He loves that people are safe. You know, if he messes up, Spider-Man always feels like shit about it I, that happened in the far from home movie you know 
various time when he's in public just whipping around saving people from getting hurt from these you know mysterio bombs also when we first see him in homecoming and he that whole iron man moment that we were talking about earlier in the movie where they had this ferry boat and he feels bad that he's responsible kind of for this whole thing happening and him like trying to chase these villains and could it lead to people dying like he felt very responsible so i think that's a major point we need to remember about spider-man he feels responsible about stuff and with great power <laughs> comes great responsibility oh i'm stupid <laughs> don't show new yorkers looting great notes man kevin foggy he knows his stuff i'm so glad i read that too because i was just gonna tell you two or three but like this is the difference you know this is what like a master does he watches something and he's just like da 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 and he also i can imagine him watching like for example ant-man and being like okay well so all these things need to connect in a certain way to the mainline movie so how can we do that in an interesting way and and it's not saying what you're making is bad it's like how can we both really make something like that moves people in in a bigger way daredevil for galactus slash surfer original story a street level vigilante in exchange for a massive alien and his cosmic herald daredevil for galactus and silver surfer doesn't sound like a fair trade if you're role playing but we're talking about film franchises here fox and marvel are talking swap according to variety fox rights to daredevil are ticking away the studio has until october 10th to reboot matt murdoch on the big screen or the rights go back to marvel variety also reports fox is talking with joe canahan on directing a daredevil reboot based on frank miller error according to the story marvel will extend the deadline if fox gives up two characters from fantastic four universe galactus and silver surfer fox is working on a fantastic four reboot with josh trank wow that's a big info dump in fact that kind of reveals a lot like i hate to say it but maybe that's why they're not a part of the mcu universe the defenders like daredevil was that associated with fox and their universe and they they wanted to keep the rights to those characters so that they can make more money in movies in the future that are unrelated and like maybe they came to a co-agreement similar to spider-man a co-financial disagreement and instead of working it out they were like no we're good y'all out <laughs> and uh and they made the opposite choice i mean but i do i remember hearing that like a lot of the rights for the characters did go back to marvel in the disney universe like for example x-men um we might be seeing some of them in the mcu universe because of contracts and agreements of co-financing etc so i wouldn't put it all off the table but i'm sure this might have even had a play in daredevil and the whole defenders and why or why not that if they're in the marvel cinematic universe or not avengers cause fisk rise to power so i think the idea here and it was kind of hard for me to pinpoint but you know with everything that the avengers do they lead a gap to be filled so if they take out a big villain a gap is there now that somebody from the lower etches of hell's kitchen can come up and overtake and rule and so a lot of daredevil and if you watch the series like the gap of power is is caused by the workings of the avengers and it's like a trickle down effect you know one thing just leads to another that all of a sudden kingpin rules new york hell's kitchen and so uh here it says uh chitari in turn caused the damage to new york city but the avengers were able to defeat them on the other hand tony stark created ultron so that could help protect the world in absence of avengers hence the blame for sokovia goes to the avengers so little trickle down effects like that and then ultron had to be dismantled because of what happened and you know we have vision now and it's like that's why it sucks because i wish we could see them canon in the mcu and really finish that story because after the release of the defenders on netflix there's just nothing else 
Um, there's been no info, no hype, or nothing about the Netflix series. It's just basically rest in peace and they're not going to continue it. And so now that we know it's like not even connected, it just this whole point is like a fan theory, you know, or even though it's, it's connected, it's uh, some other multiverse. That makes me sad because I like Daredevil. I like Punisher. I like Jessica Jones. I like Luke Cage. I didn't really like Iron Fist. I'll be honest. <laughs> but man maybe one day maybe one day we'll see these heroes again they come up a lot in this video surprisingly yeah like seriously i think that's like the 10th time i've seen daredevil in this part one through part two video about the mcu like come on <laughs> he's not even in it technically so funny north korea saved spider-man i'm gonna be very specific about this and just read it because i don't want to say it wrong Dan Slott Eisner, winning comic book writer, has written Amazing Spider-Man, She-Hulk, Silver Surfer, Batman, and more. A reader got really upset with me once for writing a scene where Spider-Man saved someone that they believed wasn't worth saving. In the end of the Earth storyline, one of the action set pieces took place on a North Korean military base. At one moment, the Reiner, rhino was about to trample a fallen North Korean soldier who was in his path, and Spidey webbed the man and yanked him out of the way. Later in the sequence, when the base was exploding, Spidey made sure to check that his friend made it clear to the area of all personnel. These moments really upset this reader because he felt that North Korea was an oppressive regime. The soldier, the people on the base were part of that regime and that they weren't worth saving. The reader also pointed out that Spider-Man was trying to save the world, that every second counted. So that should have factored into why Spider-Man shouldn't have taken the time to save that man. My take on this is simple. And by the way, I'm talking, this is what Dan Slott said. I didn't say that. Spider-Man always tried to save everyone. Peter Parker doesn't get to add writer's exception or rationalization for that. Spider-Man would save that fallen North Korean soldier. Spider-Man would save agents of Hydra. Spider-Man would save a thief, bank, robber, kidnapper, or even a murderer. Spider-Man would save the Red Skull. Spider-Man would save the burglar who shot his uncle Ben. With great, now this is me, with great power comes great responsibility. Facts, Dan Slott is right. It's like the conversation of like, and I know this is going to DC and I shouldn't, but Batman, man. Like the Joker and the Batman's interactions and whether Batman kills the Joker or not, and whether Batman kills people or not. Like if we're really thinking about who Batman is, he wouldn't kill him. He would send him back because that's the core of his character, having the right justice. You can't take like one of the core element of these characters and just throw them away because then they're not that character. If Batman kills people, he's not the Batman. He's something else. And maybe that's what a story is trying to tell. But Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and this, he's gotta be Spider-Man. And for him to be Spider-Man, he saves everyone. He doesn't try it or even allows other people to die because that would be something that weighs heavy on his heart. He cares about people. We just talked about this. Yeah, so I know I related to Batman, but it's because I just did a whole like iceberg video on Batman, which is worth checking out. I'm gonna have a link for it in the bio. Um, yeah, it's like an hour long. It's worth watching. It's really good and detailed. <laughs> I, I like Marvel and DC heroes. What can I say? In the future, I'd like for both movies to come out for both of these different entities and them to just all thrive and have a lot of great superhero movies because they're fun to watch, man. They're really fun. No sharks in the MCU. <laughs> okay, this is what actually the creator of this uh, subreddit or this post may said. It's like, it's more just a very obscure, odd bit of trivia. There isn't a single appearance of a shark across all the 20 something MCU films. <laughs> what I want to say is like, it can't be like this Arrowverse or the CW in DC where they have like a shark villain called King Shark. Yeah, and then, but apparently in the new Black Panther movie, they're gonna reveal Namor, the Submariner, who is like the king of Atlantis, and show like Atlantis versus Black Panther or Wakanda. So like, that that you know that might have a shark in it. In fact, it kind of has to. They really go down that line. So, 
hey, I'm excited for it. So actually this one might not hold up uh, in within the next few years anyway, but yeah, you're right. 12 or 20 something Marvel movies and there hasn't been a single shark. That's crazy. Beta Cinematic Universe. Hugh Jackman just barely couldn't make it in time to shoot the cameo for Spider-Man 2. Cut scene from Iron Man that was Nick Fury establishing Spider-Man, X-Men, and probably 2003 Hulk film to be in the MCU. But that's probably what Beta Cinematic Universe means. Okay, so Beta Cinematic Universe. I'm not quite sure what this means specifically, but what I saw online is that Hugh Jackman like barely made it or missed the time slot to be in Spider-Man 2. And by the way, this is Spider-Man Far From Home. And if he would have made it, then it would have introduced Nick Fury's talking about Spider-Man, X-Men, and probably the 2003 Hulk movie and how that's all connected in the MCU. And that would have been the beta cinematic universe, but it never happened. So we'll never know, we'll never see. So with that, that's it. This incredible, epic, Marvel Cinematic Universe Iceberg video. It's been a workout to get all of this out. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to make, very educational, in fact. Once again, I want to give a big thanks to Pig Seed on Reddit for making this a uh, little iceberg to explore and to research. Link in the bio for his credits. And yeah. You guys want to see more leave a comment please if you can links to support my channel in the link in the bio it helps a lot subscribe like comment you know every time you press that like button i just want you to know it helps a lot because it not only tells people that you like the video but it'll recommend the videos to different channels and you know i'm really just trying my best to keep this channel going so um you guys have a great day Stop hate, make love. Anybody can be a hero. See you next time. Oh, hey, last thing, by the way, if you want me to make a specific iceberg video or cover something specifically, let me know in the comments and I'll try to my best to do something. I'll be honest, there aren't a lot of iceberg out there in general about comic book heroes, etc. And I would love to make more content on it. Uh, and I'm going to try to make some just myself, but you know, it'll be like my first time, you know, whenever I do make it. And so um, if anybody wants to help out, I appreciate it. Peace out.